So I'm going to go ahead and get started, and we know some people will wander in, but I want to respect all of your time for being in your seats on time. Um, so I'm Catherine Couch, and I'm the founder and CEO at Ceres Community Project. We're based in Northern California, um, a, a couple counties north of San Francisco, Marin and Sonoma, um, and um, have then trained a dozen communities around the country who are replicating our model. So I'm going to spend um, the next hour or so talking about two parts of our work. The first part is how we've taken a lot of the ideas that we're talking about at this conference and brought it into a community-based grassroots model with kind of multiple layers of, of positive impact for the community. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, what's happening at a national level around food as medicine. And when I, when I use that term, because um, we've been having conversation about what that term means um, today is the actual the integration of food as a reimbursable medical expense in, on the healthcare side. And we're, we're involved in that work at a state level in California and at a national level as well. And there's a lot of really exciting work happening. And at the same time, the conversation about food quality is completely missing there. So that'll be an interesting conversation for us to have. So I'll just say, um, before I kind of get into the overview, the core part of our model is we bring teenagers into organic gardens and commercial kitchens where they serve as the gardeners and chefs. And we make about 120,000 100% organic meals a year that go to people in the community who are struggling with a health crisis. And then we do a lot of community nutrition education. So I'm going to talk about both sides of that equation, the youth side and the client side, and the power of bringing those two things together. So let's see if I went in the right direction. So I want to start by saying that we have to understand that all of these issues on the screen are one integrated issue. And in my world, I, because we're, we're the only 100% organic medically tailored meal provider in the country, I find myself in conversations a lot on one side of the circle and other conversations on the other side of the circle without those two pieces coming together. So we have to understand that food insecurity, climate change, chronic disease, our unhealthy food system, environmental de degradation, and social disconnection are all part of the same problem. And we can solve them with some simple solutions. Um, and that's what we're up to. So here's what we do. We connect people. Um, in meaningful ways with one another. There's a great study that shows that people who are disconnected from one, well, people who, people who have the experience of feeling connected to one another are 50% more likely to be alive an average of eight years later. There is not very many pharmaceuticals that will do that for you, just to say. And people who feel lonely and isolated, it is as bad for your health as being obese or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So we have to understand, and if you think at a, at a pl planetary level, an environmental level, a community level, if you think about the breakdown in our democracy, all of those are social disconnection problems. And so we have to figure out how to bring people together and feel their value and their connection as a part of a larger community. That's what our human experience has been for hundreds of thousands of years. Do you like no, I'm actually, can you, hear, okay. I, you can all hear me okay, right? Yeah, it's, it's, not that, room mic, right? it's not that big of a room. What? The recording's fine. It's just yeah. a matter of whether yeah. you guys can all hear. Yeah. Good, thank you. Okay. So, thank you. Um, we empower people. So the other thing we know is that we've become disconnected from our own power to shape our health, right? We don't believe that we can make a difference in our health. And the truth is, and I'll show you a slide later, most of our health is in our hands. That's the good news and the bad news, as we like to say. So we really, we're really working on how do we, starting with young people, have them access their own agency and power to make a difference in the world. We know when we're in touch with that, we can make anything happen. And if we're not in touch with that, we can't make very much happen. We also work on amplifying our work, right? So we. We need to generate this conversation more broadly, and we need to connect, especially connect across movements, and so that we all can tell a fuller story about the interconnection between these things. So we publish white papers. We, um, we do a lot of media. We had 4,000 media hits nationally last year about our work and about these conversations. We also advocate, um, and I'm going to talk a lot about the policy work that we're engaged with. Um, at the local level, the state level, and the national level around changing policy. Because the truth is, you know, the, um, I'm going to just <laughs> do a digression. So most of the clients we work with are living at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. 
And that population is not going to be, access, be able to access the kind of food that we're talking about without policy change. So we can continue to raise millions of dollars every year and do what we do in our community, but that's not going to get us to where we need to get to. And for me, thinking about Medicare and Medicaid is where we need to be thinking if we're going to really make a big difference for the people who are most vulnerable in our communities. And then I should have started at the top here. Uh, we nourish people. We nourish people both with food, 100% organic whole food, and also with love and connection. And then, let's see here. So, and this is how we do it. So we have community programs, client organic meal delivery, which I'm gonna talk about, our youth development program, and then we do a lot of community nutrition education. So that's what we do in our communities, the um, two counties, 2,500 square miles, where we're, we're doing direct service work. Then we have a national affiliate program where we've trained about a dozen communities around the country and now in Denmark to replicate this model, and then we do policy work. And the policy front, we have three goals. This slide needs to be updated. The first one is to prove the case for integration of food in, into healthcare. The second one is to support that integration, and the third is to make sure that we're talking about food quality and particularly organic regenerative agriculture in those food as medicine conversations. So I'm going to start with our client program. So what we so I started this program 13 years ago. And at the time, I thought we were teaching kids how to cook and making sure that people had food at a time when they most need it and they tend to have it go to the bottom of the list for a whole host of reasons. And what we realized is that most of what we're doing is about connection and belonging, but food is an incredibly powerful carrier of that, more powerful than almost anything else. So when we started in a church kitchen 13 years ago, Immediately, we started getting cards from clients, and they would say, I can feel the love in the food, and they would say, you know, my friends were cooking for me, or, or my family was, but to know that all these people who don't even know me are making this happen, it feels like the whole community cares. So now we think of the model, right, as this powerful tool for not only nourishing and educating people about healthy food, but also that, that underlying experience that we all need to, of being cared for. So what we provide is up to 24 weeks of 100% organic meals for everyone in the family. Our standard meal program right now is only five meals a week. We're going to up that to seven as our standard program, but we do up to 21 meals a week for some of our clients, and we'll talk about that on the research side. We also support everybody in the family. So here's the thing, 70% of our clients are women. If we change her eating habits and we don't bring the family along, that is not going anywhere. It is not going to be sustainable. And we know that we can use the opportunity of illness when someone is motivated to make change in the diet and when the family is motivated to support that person to educate the whole family. We also do a lot of nutrition education. It starts at intake with our clients, so we always talk with them about how they're eating now. We talk about the kind of food that we're gonna be providing. We ask them if there's a gap between those two things and are they willing to try that? And then every week, just, you know, how many of you know someone who's gone through cancer treatment? So you really don't wanna be hearing a lecture about nutrition at that point. There's a lot of other things going on. So every week we include a one page um, nutrition bite, we call it. it, has a beautiful photo of a food or a food group that's really important for your health just a few bites of nutrition education, a recipe, and that recipe is always in their bag. So there's a way that we just try to connect the dots. And we hear from our clients, you know, I, I hated beets, but I read that they were good for me, and I decided I'd try a bite of that beet, you know, barley salad, and lo and behold, I liked it and I ate the whole thing. So it's just making that simple connection for people. And then we, um, we have a team of volunteer delivery angels who deliver those meals, and we, try as much as we can to keep the same delivery angel on the same route. So that delivery angel may see that person go all the way through treatment and up to recovery. And many clients say, and we also do bouquets of flowers for our clients, the kids write cards, and that those are the things that clients will talk about as much as anything else, right? It's all of the things that surround the food, like I was saying. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people have asked us this over the years, so we're doing 100% organic food. Most of our clients are very low income. What happens when the program ends? And that's always been a really big question for us of how do we make sure that we're not dropping them off the edge of the cliff right at the end of that. So in 2009, we published a cookbook 
That was one of the tools. We started um, playing around with client um, nutrition education kinds of programming. And now we've just finished a, a two-year study funded by uh, University of California, San Francisco, um, and a cancer organization. And now what we do is four times a year, we do a four-hour nutrition education and cooking class for any of our clients who are done with the program that want to come. They make two meals that they take home. They take home a box of pantry staples and, um, and a CSA box of organic vegetables, and then we deliver vegetables and provide recipes for the next three weeks. So it's designed to create a transition into them cooking for themselves and providing some food support. And then we, we obviously connect our clients to other food resources in the community. So here are the goals. Relieve stress and improve quality of life. And I'll talk about some research around that. Reduce isolation and help clients feel cared for. Prevent or address malnutrition. And 80% um, of cancer patients, up to 80% of cancer patients experience malnutrition. When we're malnourished, we have less ability to deal with our disease. We have higher, um, higher rates of side effects, longer recovery times, and worse outcomes. And then we educate about healthy eating and improve eating habits. So it's that whole set of things that we're really um, working with our clients around. So who do we serve? Most of our clients are women. The women in the room probably know the answer to why that is. Um, most of our clients are older and illness increases with age. Although we've served um, families with new babies that had serious health problems and we've served children as young as two that had cancer. Um, and we actually have quite a few um, cancer clients now that are in their 20s and early 30s, um, which is a reflection of where we are. Um, th most of our clients are below 300% of the federal poverty level, and actually 55% are below the poverty level. So that's $16,000 a year for one person, and if you're in California, that does not go very far. Uh, most of our clients are living alone, and then diagnoses that mostly cancer, but that number has been going down. We're doing a lot more work now with congestive heart failure, with hepatitis C, um, and now starting to do some work with diabetes. And demographically, um, we're in a county that is predominantly um, Caucasian, with about 30% Hispanic, and then a number of other illnesses. And we do all of our work bilingually, so we have bilingual client care team, we have all of our materials are in English and Spanish, and we work really hard to serve that population. So this is just a little bit of the research results. So we survey our clients at intake, at completion, and then um, four to six months later. And um, this is from the, what's called the FACT-G Quality of Life Survey for Cancer Patients. And we see statistically significant improvements on eight out of um, 10 of those measures. So one of them is, I have enough social um, interaction with others. I have a lack of energy. We see really significant improvements on those. So this is the malnutrition data. So 33% um, of our clients gained weight, but more importantly, 78% had their weight move in a positive direction. So for a congestive heart failure patient, dropping weight is a really good result. For a cancer patient that is malnourished and wasting, gaining weight is a really good result. And then here's just some, um, some of the data from our surveys. 80% of clients, I ate more because I had prepared meals. So cancer patients, huge impact on appetite. They feel nauseous. One of our clients said when she was meeting with the teens, she, would, she said, even the food words were like, ugh. Like, you just don't want to think about food. And at the same time, they all know they need to be eating. And so having a prepared meal that is beautiful, delicious, and they know is good for them can really make that difference between whether they eat or not. 84% the meals help me feel better physically. Um, the healthy meals help me recover more quickly. So those are just some of the data points that we see. And then this is really, um, really interesting, right? Changes in eating habits. So... Um, you know, you can look at these 60% 60, 60 or more reducing fast food, processed food, white sugar, red meat down, vegetable consumption, fruit, whole grains up. Um, and those are, those are um, that's data that we collect four to six months after they've left our program when they're no longer eating our food compared to when they came in. Sorry, wrong way. And then last, these are just some of the comments about healthy eating. Um, we do see some small uptake in organic food purchasing. But again, we're working with a very low income population and income is clearly a, a barrier to that. So members of my family improve their eating habits. Um, I feel uh, extremely confident making a meal from scratch. So all of those kinds of um, characteristics that help people maintain this going forward. So I'm just gonna stop for a second because I'm gonna now switch to our youth program. So just any questions about what we're doing with clients? Yeah. 
So 93% of our clients say that the program helped them feel more connected and cared for. So it's the, the client care team that is in touch with them, the delivery angel every week. And I think really, like on a weekly basis, clients can call us and we'll, they have questions. But I really think fundamentally, it's this feeling that someone cares about me enough to make this meal happen for me. And were, are you the one, who, Sarah? Who, so this is my sister, Sarah, who runs our affiliate in Connecticut. And I think you were sharing the other day that a client said that they, they, were, they, um, they were committed to still being there next week so that they could get the meals. Like, the, the, no, knowing that the meals were coming made them fight for their health. So I think it's that, that experience of being part of a larger community and knowing that you're cared for is really the critical thing. Go back there. Yes, and many of our clients the same way, living alone without a support system. Yeah. yeah. So I can see how you're doing so much more than just meals. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I'll go here and then over here. Um, how do you get referred? So 50, more than 50% of our clients are now coming directly as a medical referral, um, and we're doing a lot more medical referral. We want to be able to understand somebody's complete health situation so that we can make sure the meals are right for them. So if we know a client, if a client calls with a cancer diagnosis and we don't know they're diabetic, that's going to be a problem. So 50%, and the other 50% are, I always say, like, they met someone in a support group, their hairdresser tells them, you know, there's a whole host of other ways that people learn about the program. Yeah. Over here, yeah. Um, in that tr transition period at the completion of each person's program, are you giving them, like, that list? Of yep. We have a whole completion oh. protocol with them. Yes, we're... Yes, they, um, we provide, a, you know, a, a bunch of nutrition information in their packet. There's a lot of resources on our website, and then we, well, I'll get to it, but we do more than 100 nutrition education classes a year in the community. So there's a lot of things that we surround them with, and there's a completion packet, and then there's the Healthy Transitions Program. Yeah, all of those things. Anyone else? All right, good. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about our youth program now. So the interesting thing, you know, one of the things that I say is that both youth and people diagnosed with a serious illness are more open to changing their diets than almost anyone else in the population, but for really different reasons. So if you think about, remember back to being a teenager, the fundamental work at that age is you're leaving your family of origin and you're realizing there's a lot of ways that people do things in the world. And the question is, what are my values and how are my values connected to my choices, and what is my place in the larger world. So as I said, I thought we were teaching kids how to cook. Um, but now I understand that we are failing that age group because we are not creating authentic opportunities for them to experience who they can be in the larger world. And that's essentially what we do at Ceres. We bring them in. They have the most important jobs. They are the chefs and the gardeners in the program. They're scheduled for shifts. We expect them to show up on time. And we, we create what we call a youth-owned space. So in any one of our kitchens, we, we, we have 15 different shifts a week right now, three different commercial kitchens, two organic gardens. And in every one of those, so one of our kitchens might be 15 to 18 young people with one chef, one staff chef who's running the shift, and two adults. And we have a youth development program, so we have teen leaders that have their own chef codes. And it is a youth-run space. The adults are there to help them be successful. And we're helping them connect to their ability to make a difference in someone else's life, to have agency and power in the world, to understand the connection between the choices that they make and the world that they want to create. We're giving them an authentic experience of belonging. Those are all really, really fundamental things. And the reason that we're successful is because I think there... You know, it's, it's because we are giving them an, you know, it's not, I would say to our staff, it's not about what we're doing for them. It's about what we're allowing them to do for their community. That's what keeps them coming back. And they all learn how to cook and eat kale. It, it happens, right? But that's not the fundamental, that's not the transformational thing that happens for young people in, in our program. So 
We, they come in, most of the work is what we call, let me just get through this slide and then I'll take some questions. Most of the work is, most of the learning is what we call embodied learning. They're in the garden, they're in the kitchen, they're doing things. And then we take a half an hour on every shift and we have a whole curriculum that we do. It includes values, it includes inclusion, responsibility, teamwork, visits with clients, which I'll, I can talk about, um, but also nutrition and, and food systems. So we talk about hunger and food insecurity. We talk about food waste. We talk about composting. We talk about packaging. We talk about all of those issues. And there's a really interesting study that was done at Stanford that um, where they, you know, they were trying to help young people make healthier food choices by connecting to their own mortality, which is not a big motivator when you're 14, but it is a huge motivator where you can connect your food choices to farm worker health, to health equity, to climate change, to all of those things, right? And so that's what we really focus on. Then we have visits with clients. So every teen in our program, we do these three times a year, has sat with a client, heard their story, and had someone look at them and say, thank you for helping save my life. Now, even just hearing someone's story about going through, you know, through cancer or, or heart disease, it's, it opens the heart, right? We start, to, we start to experience our own capacity for compassion, which is fundamental, right, if we're gonna create a, a more sustainable and just world. But the piece around a client saying, thank you for helping save my life, that's the piece where we connect youth to their power to make a difference in the world around them and their value as a contributing member of, of the community. And then we have a leadership program um, where kids you know, earn different things and, and at the year level, they can become part of our teen leader program. They all get their own chef coats. They're expected to be part of the management team in the kitchen and we do leadership development with them. Um, and then lots of kind of work ready kinds of things. And I, I jokingly say, depending on what funder I'm talking to, I talk about either one or all of, all of these things. And then 32% um, of the kids are involved for one year or more, and we have kids who've been with us for four or five years. So, quick question, yeah. What was the age range? 14 to 14, it was originally 14 to 19, now I'd say it's 14 to 22, because we have kids who are at the junior college and who just don't want to leave, um, and we, <laughs> we, we allow them to stay. So here's our, our youth program goals, which you probably heard in what I was saying already. Learn to grow, cook, and eat healthy food understand the impact of food choices, improve eating habits, access their agency and power to make a difference, experience community, expand their capacity for compassion, increase self-esteem and self-confidence, develop leadership, and gain work ready and job skills. So it's, it's and the amazing thing, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't take a lot of credit for this model, I felt like I kind of channeled it, but it all just happens. I mean, we, we now have curriculum and all that stuff, but before we had any of those things, just the fact of bringing the kids into the kitchen and empowering them to serve their community, lots of this happened um, before, before any of the accoutrements that we've added on top. So here's just a little bit of the data of the youth program. So we do what's called positive youth development and that starts with young people feeling like they have a safe place to come. So 100% of our young people say they feel safe at series, I feel supported by staff, um, there are rules I'm expected to follow, staff expect me, to, to step up, you know, all of those factors. And that's, those are fundamental characteristics for a successful youth development program. And then these are improvements in skill levels. So we ask kids in the garden and the kitchen how confident they are on different things and then we retest them. Um, and we say really big gains in their confidence level. Um, and you know, it's interesting with teens that um, they wanna think that they know how to do something, but that's a real difference than being in a professional commercial kitchen where you know, things really have to get done on time and there are right ways to hold knives and, um, and safety and sanitation is important. And so they all learn all of that stuff. And one of the things about the safety and sanitation piece is we talk a lot about our, our clients being immune compromised and how critically important it is that we be ri really rigorous around food safety. Um, and that's powerful for young people. So here's some of the outcomes that happen during the program itself. So 54% of our kids are eating six servings of vegetables and fruits, or I think it's just vegetables, no, fruits and vegetables a day, compared to in California, only 22% of kids are eating five. So that's, you know, in the conversation we're having, really significant. 77% are at least somewhat confident they can prepare a healthy meal from scratch, and that goes up among our alumni. 16% 16 more teens say, I can work with someone who has different ideas than I do. Again, what, what, I, 
I'm not joking, I, I, I consider our work about democracy <laughs> because if we don't understand that we're all on the same team, you know, we're, we're not gonna get there. And so this idea of being able to, we pull kids from 65 schools into our kitchens and we have all kinds of kids, right? We have the 4.5 who's going to Columbia pre-med. We have the kid who's in a continu continuation high school or maybe in foster care. And, um, and they find friends that they never would have found before. And they realize they can work with people that they didn't think they could work with. And those are really significant outcomes. Um, you know, they talk about uh, important skills or responsibility and communication, um, learning how to work as part of a team, being able to ask for what you need, um, being able to explain something to someone else or train someone else on a job. Those are all really fundamental life skills. And then 23 percent say the most important thing they learned was the importance of community. And we really feel strongly about that one. That again, this idea that we, we sink or sweat, you know, I had the insight the other day and probably some of you have had this too, but you know, we used to be in these small communities and these small tribes and we knew that we were dependent on each other. And we're actually more dependent on each other now but at a planetary level, and our consciousness hasn't caught up with that. We have to start remembering what, the ways in which our interdependency really matters. And then these are, um, we also do alumni surveys, so we go out every two years to all the kids who've been out of the program for two years or longer. And 47% are cooking from scratch four days a week or more. How many of you do that? I, I mean, I do most days, but, but not a lot of adults are cooking that much. 78% um, describe their diet as mostly whole foods. 60% are continuing to be involved in community, and 95% say their time with us was instrumental in that. And 58% are either um, in medicine, public health, nutrition, sustainable agriculture, um, community organizing, or culinary. And 78% say their time with us was important to that. So we have really good long-term data now about how this program is really shaping lives in a way that we're helping to build a, a really empowered next generation that's going to help us get where we need to go. Yeah. Is this something that's California specific or just? No, we, we are um, headquartered north of San Francisco, but we, we train communities in, in two more slides. I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. So good segue, but just a little bit early. Um, so nutrition education. We started really early on doing nutri nutrition education and we've tried lots of different kinds of programming. Now we do essentially three and a half different things. So we are, are now the primary nutrition education provider for two community health centers. So we do programming two hour classes every other week at those health centers and patients are referred into that programming. And we have a set of classes that we do and they're on topics, blood sugar control, and and healthy fats and all that. We also are now in our fourth or fifth year of a contract with the Sonoma County Public Library System and also with now the Marin Public Library System. And we do anywhere from 11 to 30 classes a year in the public libraries, including classes for five to eight year olds, for nine to 12 year olds, for teens, for adults. Um, and those are really successful and especially the, kid, the classes for children um, because the, they're all full and the parents come and the parents stay. Um, and we see that as a really important part of our prevention strategy. I mean, the youth program is a prevention strategy too, but, but that's really important to us. And then we do a set of our own classes. Um, and many of these classes we do in English and Spanish, both. And our own classes, we're starting to do a lot more cooking classes. We have eight chefs on our staff. And so um, we have somebody who's got a raw, raw foods background and a big fermenter and somebody that does gluten-free sourdough bread. And, and those classes are also really popular. Um, and we do those. And then we do a lots of, um, we're doing a lot more work now with Kaiser with, um, through their employee wellness program, training doctors. Um, and other kinds of things like that that are, that are more, more of the one-off, um, I, I would say. And um, we're now really seen as kind of the respected nutrition educa educator in our community, and, and we're really happy to do that work, and we see it as synergistic with everything else that we're, that we're doing. And I think one of the things that I, that I feel about our model is um, because we exist in the community and we pull in... 600 adult volunteers a year and you know a couple thousand donors and there's all the family members and friends of those kids and the family members and friends of those clients that we create this ripple effect in terms of shifting the conversation about the power of food 
um, for health and really reconnecting those two things. So it's not just the people we serve directly, but it's that broader conversation that's gen generated in the community and the nutrition education is part of that. So um, our affiliate program. So we published a cookbook in 2009 and people started, you know, our little fan club in Sonoma County started sending it around and people started calling us and saying, oh my God, we're so inspired by what you're doing and we'd like to do it here. And we started with a Presbyterian church in Bay Village, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, and then a cancer support program in Summit, New Jersey. And after about three or four years, we kind of codified that, and we started what we call our national affiliate program. So um, right now, we're in conversation with four different communities. So whenever people are ready, we, um, we help them get ready. And when they're ready, they come, and we do a, an intensive four-day training with them. And then we provide ongoing uh, mentoring and support um, to them all year round with our team. So uh, youth program, client program, volunteer program, um, those calls. And then I work with the executive directors of those programs every, every other month. And then we just, um, Sarah and I just came from Chicago. So now we do an annual convening. All of our programs, including Denmark, were together for two days. And we, we learn and share together. And the idea was really to create a learning community because this model is continuing to evolve and we're all learning and innovating and we want to make sure that that's being shared across the network. So we're, um, it's, it's very low cost. We asked $1,500 up front and to sign the licensing agreement and then um, our affiliates pay us 3% of their gross revenues going forward. We want to set the bar high enough that, um, that we make sure that the team that comes is actually going to be able to make something happen in their community. But, but not so high that they try to figure it out on their own. Because frankly, we've made all the mistakes um, that you could make, and we don't want people to have to do that. We want to help people be successful quickly. Um, so now I'm going to completely switch gears, and I'm going to talk about policy. So I always share this slide. I, I, I do a lot of speaking in kind of the organic food, um, sustainable ag world, and a lot of, of um, speaking in the um, medically tailored meal, food as medicine world. And I just think it's really important that we all ground ourselves in these basic facts, right? 42% of Americans are food insecure. Food insecurity drives $77 billion a year in healthcare costs. And we're not even talking about food quality here. We're just talking about having enough food to eat. Um, and if you add lost productivity, it's $160 billion a year. That's huge to take in. 60% of deaths in the US are related to chronic disease that are preventable by good nutrition. And I don't have the data, but that's many billions more <laughs> in unnecessary healthcare costs. And then, you know, 40%, this is from the white paper that we did on, on the power of organic food. 40% of children now have high enough pesticide levels that it could impact brain development. Like, we, we have to take that in. We have to take that in. And then you talk about, uh, about climate, and agriculture is one of the drivers of climate change, but it could be the solution if we think about it correctly. And so you know, that's, the, that's the landscape in which um, you know, we're having this conversation at all the levels that we're having it. So this is, how many of you have heard of social determinants of health? Great. So what we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years is that only 20% of our health outcomes are related to what happens in the doctor's office. And healthcare's realize this. 30% are the choices we make. Enough sleep, good relationships, healthy diet, exercise. But 40% is what I like to say are the things that are constraining that cho those choices for some of us, right? If you are living in poverty, dealing with systemic racism, you know, all of those things, you don't have a safe place to let your kids go outside, you run out of food by the third week of the month. Um, you're making choices between your medication and your um, electricity bill in winter or having enough food for your kids. You are not in a position to be able to make healthy choices for yourself or your family. And the, the good news is that healthcare has started to connect the dots about, the, about those things. Um, so what we know is one in three people are going to enter the hospital malnourished. We have an aging population. 92% of that aging population have at least one chronic disease, 77% of at least two. The um, predicted rise in chronic illness is 57% by 2020, that's World Health Organization, and 80% of our healthcare is going to chronic disease prevention. And again, healthcare is connecting the dots about these things. 
that's the really good news. And that's where, that's the, the opportunity that I'm going to share with you. <laughs> so food as medicine is gaining incredible momentum around the country. We're part of two national coalitions, two statewide coalitions, and three regional coalitions around food as medicine. Every insurer in the country has their at least their toe in the water, if not more than that, around this work. They are understanding that they are not going to get to patient outcomes that they want or reduce health care costs without addressing social determinants of health. And one of the interesting things here is imagine you're a big health insurer or you're a big health provider and you're looking at your community and you're thinking, okay, are we going to take on housing or are we going to take on food insecurity? Food insecurity is a lot cheaper, you get faster results, and it's measurable. So a lot of the work that's happening around social determinants is around food. Um, so there, we're part of the two national coalitions that we're part of. One is the Food as Medicine Coalition. This is a set of agencies that started during the AIDS HIV epidemic. And what they realized really early on is when AIDS patients had good nutrition, their viral loads went down and they were less likely to transmit the disease. So because of that, when the federal government funded the Ryan White Act, they included home delivered meals as a reimbursable medical expense. That is still happening. Those age, some of my colleagues are getting $3 million a year to provide home delivered meals to people with AIDS. It's the only place in the federal government until very recently where that was the case. But what happened was as the AIDS epidemic evolved, they were all like, now we're serving cancer patients. Now we're serving heart disease patients. Does nutrition make a difference there? Of course, the answer is yes. So that coalition is the leading group actually doing the research around medically tailored meals. And there are a set of published studies there at the end of my slides basically showing pretty consistent results. And I have a slide on that. We're also part of a coalition called Root Cause. And this started five years ago. It is, there are 65 members nationally. They do an annual conference, 600 people. It is the only place that I'm aware of bringing together health providers, insurers, and community-based organizations, really working on this question of how do we crack the nut to be able to actually prescribe, refer people to or prescribe these non-clinical services and track their results and reimburse them within the healthcare model. And really important work happening there. Massachusetts, we're in Massachusetts, um, the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation at Harvard, who's one of our consulting partners, and Community Servings, which is our colleague organization in Boston, led the charge to create a Massachusetts state food as medicine plan. You can Google that and find it. And now they're working on a policy platform um, to basically drive food as medicine investments in Massachusetts. And other states are now looking at doing that. And then um, Medicare. Uh, Medicare Advantage, which is the program that serves about a third of Medicare patients last year, changed the rules so that for some Medicare patients, people with chronic disease at risk of being hospitalized or at risk of going to skilled nursing, could be provided with home delivered meals and have it be covered by Medicare. It's a really big move in the, in the level of kind of federal um, insurance programs. And um, Congressman McGovern from Massachusetts is now introducing bipartisan legislation to do a national food as medicine pilot in fee-for-service Medicare, which is the Medicare program that serves the other two-thirds of Medicare patients. And you know that will all take a while, but it's a really important step. And then um, Google Kaiser Milken Institute. So I just, um, I'm part of a group at Google called the Google Food Lab. And we just, um, Google has just launched a four-year accelerator project um, on plastics and packaging, biodiversity, plant-forward diets, and food as medicine. And I was one of the leads on the Food as Medicine Accelerator. And we, it's not out yet, but we've developed a, a Food as Medicine Explainer website hub and also a map that maps all of the veggie RX food pharmacies and medically tailored meal programs in the country. And the idea is to start to reflect back to the community the, the considerable amount of work that's being done. And finally, Kaiser, how many of you know Kaiser Permanente? They're one of the big health systems in the country. They have just committed to um, two-year medically tailored meal pilots in four of their regions, and they're putting significant resources into those, and will be one of the agencies conducting those pilots. And you know, if we, can, if we can move the needle with Kaiser so they start to really integrate food as medicine into their system, that will, and, and they're really willing to be a leader and come out kind of publicly, that will help to move the needle on this work. So 
we have to think about food as medicine in the full continuum, right? So we talk about, in, our, in my world, the prevention treatment continuum. So if you look at this chart, all of this matters, right? It's not just medically tailored meals. We have to think about food across the full spectrum. That means school lunch. That means the women, infant, and children's program. That means improving SNAP or food stamp resources, all of those things. Home delivered meals were, were part of some conversations in California around aging. How do we start to really think differently about Meals on Wheels program? So if you are a senior with congestive heart failure and diabetes, a standard Meals on Wheels meal is not going to make the difference that you need. We have to start thinking in a much more nuanced way about food security. And often I talk about nutrition security. So those conversations are really rich and happening. Um, not probably as much as they should be, but, but, but they're moving forward. So this is just a way of, of you know, I'm going to talk a bunch about medically tailored meals because that's the work that we're doing. But we have to talk about all of this, right? Back to 42% of our population's food insecure. That's driving $77 billion in healthcare costs. And we're not even talking about you know, chronic disease and medically tailored. So that's really important. So here, this is a summary of about four or five research studies that have been done on medically tailored meals. So the bottom line is we are consistently showing 16% net savings on the healthcare cost side when we, improve, when we include this intervention, right? So these, these meals are improving medication adherence, um, reducing hospital stays, keeping people out of um, skilled nursing facilities, um, but fundamentally, they are cost effective for insurers, and that is the bottom line if we're going to if we're going to drive change. And that's and again, the studies are at the at the end. Um, but there's really good research base, and this is what we use. We built on this research base um, to do what we did in California, which I'm going to talk about. So we're currently doing these three different research studies right now. Um, we are one of six agencies that was able to get six million from the state of California to do the first statewide medically tailored meal pilot within the Medicaid program. Um, we're also doing a discharge study with Kaiser. It's very, very small, and it was part of what led them to this larger investment that they're now making. And then I'm going to talk about this really great program we did earlier this year called Smart Box, which was done in a largely Hispanic neighborhood, and it was um, included a bunch of different elements to it. So the first one is the California study. And again, we took the research from our colleagues and we, um, through our uh, state center in California, we were able over um, four months to get the state legislature to give us $6 million to design this first statewide study. And um, what's really important here is all of the research being done to date is basically um, you know, one organization in one community. And I was trying to sell Kaiser on doing research. And they're all like, that's so nice that they did that in Philadelphia. But I don't, I don't know that that would work here. So every, you know, it's easy to discount when it's like one, one, one. So the idea was we have um, six agencies in California that do medically tailored meals from San Diego County, LA County, Santa Clara County, San Francisco, Alameda, and Sonoma and Marin. And we came together and created a standard intervention that we were all committed to doing, which is not an easy thing, just to say, because we all do things a little differently, and, um, and got funding to provide this intervention to 1,000 congestive heart failure patients. We're about halfway through right now. And the exciting thing at the end is there is an outside, a major national evaluator that will be coming in at the end and actually doing the evaluation within the Medi-Cal claims database, looking at actual changes in utilization of healthcare services and costs. We think it's going to show, well, I'll show you some data, um, pretty significant savings. And so the idea then is to drive this to becoming a standard reimbursable benefit across the entire state. Um, and then we're already working on a second pilot idea. So the intervention is not just meals. So the patients are getting 21 meals a week, um, all heart healthy, you know, medically tailored meals, plus for, for uh, 12 weeks, plus three home visits with a registered dietitian, three or four home visits with a registered dietitian, and then wellness checks at delivery, conversations with our client care team, and social support. So we're talking about a population that's living at or below 138% of the federal poverty level. Many of them are verging on homelessness. They have 
they never have only congestive heart failure. They all have multiple chronic illnesses. It's a very challenging population to engage in this kind of intervention and to keep in the inter intervention. So there's definitely a lot of case management support that goes into it. So here's um, data at the end of September. We had um, enrolled 404 patients out of the 1,000, 702 medical nutrition visits, 66,000 meals. But this is a really interesting statistic, and I shouldn't really have this in writing. But um, the statewide, so hospitals do not get reimbursed for unplanned readmissions before 30 days since the Affordable Care Act went into place. So there's a lot of drive around preventing those readmissions. The statewide readmission rate for this population is 33%. Our readmission rate for this population that we're serving is about 6 to 7%. So the gap between 6.6 or 7% and 33% represents a tremendous amount of cost. And that's where we're going to be making the case that this should be a standard benefit for this population. So I'm going to just, I'm going to stop there because it's a, that's a lot I've been covering. So any questions about what's, you know, the food is medicine work, about research, about this study? Yeah. We as an organization, are you talking about we as an organization are making profit? In your, in your little, you know, no. no. We're not making a profit. are more expensive than, than, the, than the cost of the, the, the savings that you have. No, I'm saying there's a net savings after the cost of the intervention. Cost of the intervention. Yes, significant net savings after the cost of the intervention. Yeah, so that's why we're talking about net, net savings. Yeah. So all, so all six agencies make their own meals from scratch with a largely volunteer, local volunteer community. We're the only ones with youth. We're the only ones doing 100% organic. But these are high quality, made from scratch meals. And one of the interesting things that, that's happening is as healthcare dollars become available for this, you can imagine there's some for-profit competitors that are really interested in coming into this space. And none of that, so, the, you know, the drop ship meals from, from Iowa at $7.50 with all that packaging um, and no conversation about food quality. And so the interesting thing in this world is there's a, you know, when you talk about a medically tailored meal, you're talking about a meal that has a certain amount of carbs and a certain amount of saturated fat and a certain amount of, um, of sodium, right? So that's where the whole conversation is on the medically tailored meal side. There is almost no conversation on, in that community about food quality, environmental impact, like any of that. We are starting to bring that conversation in. And in my conversations with Kaiser at a national level, they use this for-profit dropship person, <laughs> who I'm not going to mention, who's at every health conference now. And one of the things I said to them is, if you're committed to building community health you have to stop using that provider, and you have to invest in the capacity of local solutions. And they get it. Now, imagine if you're a healthcare provider, and your region, like our Medicaid provider, serves 14 counties. We serve two. So we have to be part of figuring out that solution so that we can be that solution for them, and they're not forced to go to that provider that can drop ship everywhere. So this is one of the complexities happening right now in this world. Yeah. Every organization is doing their own, yeah, food sourcing, yeah. yeah. So let's, so this is the other really exciting project that we did this year, and it was um, funded through some work that's happening at the county level that I'm part of around heart disease. And we were um, looking at how to pilot some ideas around, again, empowering low-income community members to really um, think about their food choices differently. So this program was a um, low-income community. Everyone either had high blood pressure and or diabetes, which are what are called the medical risk factors for heart disease. So they, they don't have heart disease yet, but they have some chronic illness. 
And so what we did was we, we brought those families together for 12 weeks. We did the meetings at the local elementary school. They were all taught in Spanish with simultaneous translation. They could bring their whole family. We had childcare. And we did it as a cohort model, so they got to learn from each other. And we did some really basic nutrition education. We had people in the class that weren't literate, so it was a lot of pictures and talking. Um, and every week they went home with five prepared meals for everyone in the family, because it's really important for people to understand what a healthy plate looks like, what healthy portion sizes look like. And then they went home with a whole ton of food from the food bank and recipes. And every week they came back and we talked about what they had cooked, whether they liked it, they shared ideas with each other. And we had some really significantly positive results. And we're now trying to find funding to do two more cohorts because 17 families is not, you know, it's not enough to prove the case to, um, to healthcare to invest. But this is really exciting. And I think very few programs, if you look in your own communities, are combining nutrition education and food access in a way that can really improve outcomes. We're very interested, for example, in there's a lot of um, diabetes self-management programs, they're called, where, where people learn how to manage their diabetes. But none of them are pairing it with food. So imagine if you're, if you're someone who's never eaten healthy, now you've got all this information, but no one's, no one's showing you, what does a healthy plate look like? And do I actually like that food? And how do I start actually building the muscle to cook that food? So we're really, at a, at a national level among my colleagues, really interested in some research around pairing, doing like a randomized controlled trial. Diabetes self-management alone, diabetes self-management with 12 weeks of medically tailored meals, and what would happen over the next year or two for, for those cohorts. So this, we're, we were really excited about this model. And I'm, just, I'm gonna show you some of the results. So 100% of these families were food insecure um, at the beginning. Of course, we gave them a lot of food, so you know, there was a big change in that, but I think it's, it's an aha moment. We have not screened for food insecurity among our client population because it's not a criteria for service. But in January, we're going to start screening for food insecurity. And one of the things we're looking at is for extremely food insecure clients, we may, this is why we're going to go to seven meals a week, we may give them a double portion. So really recognizing that our clients have different needs and how do we respond to that. So this is changes in, um, in uh, consumption. So a fourfold increase uh, in um, consumption of vegetables. Um, a slight decrease in fruit consumption, which is not a bad thing for, um, for diabetics. Increase in whole grains. No clients said they were eating no, low, no high sodium foods. And 38% said they were eating no high sodium foods at the end of the intervention, right? So, so there's no bar, there's no, no blue bar, because there's nobody at pre was not eating high sodium foods, 38% after. And then these were attitudes about healthy eating. So I know the benefits of healthy eating. It's important that I have healthy eating habits. It's important from, uh, that my family has healthy eating habits. And then the only one that didn't get to 100% is I enjoy healthy food. Um, but you know, we, saw, we did see an increase there. So again, so we changed, we, we significantly changed consumption, attitudes, and I don't have the slide here, but also confidence in making healthy food choices. And so, again, we're really excited about um, the potential of this model. And what we want to do going forward is do it within a community health center so those patients are tracked over time um, and we can really start to see whether those, um, whether those changes last. And then I'll just mention some other things. We um, were involved regionally in, in coalitions and um, actually all of this is about organic, so I'll just say something about that. Um, I had a kind of an aha a year ago because I, I'm in, you know, back to that circle, I'm in all these conversations kind of about chronic disease and food insecurity where there's no connection to the environmental and climate health part. And then, you know, I speak at EcoFarm with CCOF and, and we're 100% organic and we live in that world too. And the aha that I had was that there is tr this tremendous momentum happening around food as medicine. It is, it is like a wave right now. And if we, don't get the, if we don't get these two movements connected and we don't start to talk about food quality and food sourcing and procurement guidelines and all of that within the food as medicine side, we are gonna end up with more health inequity. We are not gonna solve the climate pro problem. I mean, we're gonna exacerbate these problems. And 
Um, we have got to start again. I feel like my biggest job right now is helping people understand that more of that circle is part of their conversation and getting them educated enough to be able to connect the dots in all of the circles where they're sitting. Is there any way to identify differences between those big community programs? Yeah, we will, we will definitely look at whether our patients do better, but the reality is, um, the reality is that the most significant thing at an individual patient level is that they're eating vegetables and whole grains and not eating processed food. It's at a public health level that we need to be talking about these changes. And when, you're, when I'm talking to communities where there's a lot of food insecurity, people need more food and then they need the healthiest food possible. That's true. And, but it's, it's, it's understanding that, you know, and, and this is where I think it's so exciting that health, so my thing about getting this work into healthcare is we are not going to improve um, SNAP benefits at the federal level. Certainly not in this administration, but probably even in the next administration. It, there is such a conversation about entitlement programs at the federal level, but there is a tremendous amount of money to access in healthcare. Healthcare is used to paying for things that are really expensive. If we can connect the dots and show healthcare savings, we can extract tremendous amounts of money from insurers and healthcare providers to drive food access. And that's really, I mean, really, that's the bottom line for me, is we're not going to solve it in the traditional ways, but we can, we can start to solve it by connecting the dots about food and health and about, about outcomes and cost savings. So there's a lot that we're, we're doing there. And healthcare, like Kaiser, for example, has a very strong community health and public health framework. So when you start to connect the dots for them, that they can drive more benefits at the community and public health level by, by establishing food quality standards, that's something that they're predisposed to understand. So I actually feel really, and so that's the conversation I'm having over there. And with my colleagues, I'm saying, if you want to be relevant to healthcare, they're going in this direction. You better change what you're doing or you're not going to be able to sell to them. Because Dignity Health in California is already committed to 20% organic by the end of this year, I think. Kaiser is committed to 100% sustainably sourced by 2025 in all of their facilities. So healthcare is making this connection already. Thank thankfully, I, I want to thank Healthcare Without Harm because they're driving a lot of those conversations. But that conversation is happening. And on the public health front, I said this to someone earlier, CDC has named climate change a public health emergency. The California public health officers have a, a, issued a statement about climate, and, and it's all connected to health equity. So this, these conversations, at some level, these conversations are starting to be connected, but it's not coming down to the implementation level. And that's where we all have to be at these tables willing to say the hard things that our colleagues in the room don't want to hear about this stuff. So we are working closely with CCOF. How many of you have seen the benefits report? So CCOF, California Certified Organic Farmers, they're the largest certifier of organics in the world. They came out in February with a report called the Benefits Report. Uh, and and they're, they're, I mean, they're focused in California right now, but it's, um, California is the largest producer of organics, but it's 4% of state agriculture. Four. 4%. So the, their goal is how do, we, how do we get California to 10% organic by five years from now or 10 years from now? And they put together this amazing report that has 330 different studies on it on the broad spectrum be benefits of organic, including poverty alleviation, um, nutrient density, climate change, environmental benefits, water. And the thing that struck me the most is organic farms employ more year-round labor. When farm workers have year-round labor, they don't have to move. And what happens? Their children get to stay in school. Graduation from high school is one of the number one predictors of lifetime health and life expectancy. So there's a clear social determinants of health linkage between that investment. Now, most people, we would not think that, right? So the report is really a valuable tool, and I'm working with them now on a policy platform for California to kind of move this into action. Um, so we're doing that. We're driving kind of food sustainability guidelines in the conversations that we're in. Th these are some state. California right now is revisioning Medicaid and is also working on a master plan on aging over the next year. And so we're engaged in a bunch of conversations. 
around how do we insert these conversations about um, food and nutrition security, especially with the aging population, the higher rates of chronic disease, how do we start thinking differently about the kind of investments that we need to make. And then UC Davis has written this into a really interesting NIH study around plant-forward diets for diabetics. And the conventional wisdom, of course, is low carbs. But if you are eating a whole food um, diet, you know, can you get the same results as cutting out carbs and focusing on, on um, low carb and, and protein? So hopefully that's going to get funded and we'll be part of that next year. And then I've talked a bunch about organics. The only other thing that I want to say is um, Healthcare Without Harm and CCOF and I did a great workshop at the Root Cause Coalition back in October around connecting the dots between these. And we got really positive results from people. And again, I just, you know, all of you in the room are in all kinds of <laughs> different circles out in the world. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that this presentation helps to empower you to start to help people connect the dots between all of these different movements, which are really one conversation in my mind. So I'm going to stop there. Um, there are uh, references in my slides. I'm sure they're going to get sent out. But I'd love to open it up for a conversation. Um, questions that you have, things that you're doing or aware of that are happening in this space. Yeah. Um, Go pink and then over. Uh, if you uh, cultural um, preference of food is taken into consideration from community to community, and, and also if yeah. if you monitor um, or you know, survey how many people are getting supplements, Yes, we're, we're not quite where I want to be with that, but we've started to connect, uh, to gather information about CalFresh enrollment, which is our version of SNAP in California. Um, in terms of the cultural relevance point, we're in this conversation constantly. And the interesting thing, if you think about it, is for most people, they want the food that their family ate. And that is a level of nuance no food provider is ever going to be able to match. Um, so I think it's, people are always asking us that, and I'm not sure what the right answer is about that. That one part of where it said that the healthy food statistic was, you know, they're associating healthy food with not being that tasty. I was wondering why is it, you know, who's answering the question? Is it because it's not something they're familiar with? You know? Right, and, and I think one of, the thing that we find with our clients is, Many of our clients are not eating the way that we're cooking for them when they start. And the benefit of getting meals for 12 weeks or 16 weeks or 24 weeks is they realize, oh, I didn't think I liked quinoa or kale or sea vegetables or whatever it is. And it's actually pretty good. Or I, you know, I develop a taste for it. And they have the direct experience, I feel better when I eat this way. And that those are really important parts of the conversation to actually lead to lasting dietary change. And I think that's the benefit of an intervention that lasts over time for people. And yeah, we'll go back here and then there. Of course, in place after the 12 weeks or however long the program, like the, um, yep. the Smart Box program goes, uh, you know, ongoing support. Uh, one, one of my thoughts in my community is a people's kitchen where we can prepare batch food together. Yep. Yep. You know, and we can share recipes and, and really health, adjust them for health, yep. uh, healthy food. Um, yeah, and there are definitely people doing those kinds of community kitchens around the country. So Smartbox, I, I won't go into the details, but it was a little bit of an odd situation. We had some, some funding through a grant and had to be, that, that was part of a county grant, had to be used by a certain time. And it, it's, it wasn't set up well, and that's why if we recreate it, we're gonna do it within a health center context where those patients are then in a, in a relation, held in a relationship going forward. Yes, we would still do all of that, but then you know, most of our health centers have food banks at their, at their center, and all, you know, all of that. And we can also tra track health, health outcomes over time which is really important. I'm going to go here and then back there. Yeah. So how do you uh, fund the main, your main operation? I beg. <laughs> so we're, we have really diverse funding, um, foundations, corporate, individuals, and um, some government funding now from the, the state pilot program. Um, and, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, 
you know, that's also part of the equation. We can expand our work. If we can, you know, if, if five years from now, 40% of our meals are paid for by healthcare contracts, that means that we can serve that many more people in our community. So. Yeah, so thank you for reminding me that. So um, how are we funded? The question was, how are we funded? And I said, I, we, I beg. <laughs> um, but we're, we're really diverse. So we have probably three or four dozen foundation funders that fund us um, and from all over the country. Yeah. So with your franchise, do you so they are all independent 501c3 nonprofit organizations, um, but we help them in terms of understanding what it takes to be successful with fundraising, and we share grant applications and, um, and things like that. So we, we help set them up for success, but they're, they're responsible for their own fundraising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you been able to tap into the food stamp program? So have we been able to stamp to uh, get get money from food stamps? So no, the answer is no. The food stamp program has quite a few restrictions on how food stamps can be used, um, and some of that is starting to change. So in California, they have what they call the restaurant meals program, and um, I'm smirking. So for people who are homeless or unstably housed, they can get a special voucher to use their food stamps at fast food restaurants. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? I think so. Well, it would make so much sense that they give that, some of that money to be tapped Yeah. So the two things that, that are being worked on around food stamps is one is um, having food stamps be used for home delivered meals, which would um, help a lot of our clients. And the second is for, um, for people with food stamps to be able to purchase food online with their food stamps. So imagine if you're homebound right. and you have food stamps. It seems like yeah. there could be a designation. Yeah. So those conversations are, are happening. And, um, and in California, there's definitely a conversation around, you know, these programs were developed a long time ago. And how do we adjust them to what we know now the population needs are? Yeah. So yeah, back. Are there We're lucky. So the question was, you know, if people are living in food deserts and they've gone through this program, how do you help them buy this kind of food going forward? So we're really lucky. We have a very um, forward-thinking food bank in, in um, our area called Redwood Empire Food Bank. And, um, you know, they were one of the early ones that started to decline certain kinds of food from donors. Um, they're 50% fresh produce now. They have quite a bit of organic stuff. And um, we have an extensive network of food bank, of pantries and produce markets um, that are run by the food bank. So there are very few neighborhoods in our area that don't have access to fresh food at least once a week. And many of the health centers as well are connected in. So I think that's the, the benefit of kind of overlapping with the, with the health center network. So we have like 15 more minutes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, fine. that's okay. Any um, interest or plan, or maybe an ex external organization that looks into gardening um, as, a, as another alternative or way of securing healthy food? There's a there are a lot of organizations that are doing that work um, around the country. Do and pardon? Well, we have our own, we have our own organic gardens that we that we run. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't. I don't know off the, off the top of my head, other than the school garden network in Sonoma County, whether in our region that's happening. But you know, when you think about food security, the food security conversation. So urban gardening, um, you know, CSA programs, extension work. I mean, there's probably people in the room that could help answer that question. So. Usually people have their own, are part of a community garden and they have their own bed. Mm -hmm. 
that they tend and harvest. That's my experience with those programs. Mm -hmm. Market. Great. And I think just to say to, you know, you're asking about food stamps. The other thing is to make sure that your community is accessing the market match funding. So under the Food Insecurity and Nutrition Incentive Program at USDA, through the work that was done in Michigan and then with Wholesome Wave, there's $100 million, I think it might, it's at least that much, of money that's designed for um, people on food stamps to double their spending at farmers markets. And that's a really important way of connecting people to fresh, local, and mostly, and a lot of times, organic food, and also support our farmers. And in our community, um, all of the farmers markets take market match, and there's a whole kind of community-wide effort um, to make sure that we're educating um, people on SNAP about, about that benefit. So it's a really good tool to know. But I'm going to go here and then there. focuses on helping community gardens with their soil yeah. to yeah. make it growable yes. and yes. Uh, yeah. remediate any toxic <coughs> issues that they have. But we're always looking for ways of expanding that food access program to um, try to connect, you know, mm -hmm. years ago we tried to connect hospitals to uh, growers and farmers. I think we were a little bit premature yep. in this, yep. in this uh, the whole institutional um, um, matching piece and, and being able, able to aggregate from farmers and do institutional purchasing right. is... So a, your experience is really, uh, I think, will be really helpful in how we, you know, continue to roll those programs. Great. And, and are you working with Healthcare Without Harm? Uh, I don't think that we have. Because I would really encourage you to work with them. They have been exclusively working in the healthcare space for over 20 years around environmental impacts. And they have a huge um, part of their work now that is around food. They developed what is called the Environmental Nutrition Framework, which is understanding that the, we have to think about nutrition in its broadest sense. And then they have developed national food procurement guidelines for healthcare and um, do quite a bit of work on the healthcare space and can be a real, um, uh, a mediator is not the right word, but a connector to the, the, the hospitals in your region that are ready for this, con more ready for this conversation than others. So I would really look at them. Yeah. 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 There's a lot happening, and I think it's, it's always about being able to figure out who in your community is kind of the leading edge of that conversation, um, and then being able to help amplify what they're doing, help tweak it if it needs to be tweaked, but then help amplify it. That's the way we, you know, we, we start with where the, where the doors are, are at least cracked open, I like to say. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's okay. Um, Yeah, CCOF, okay. so California Certified Organic Farmers. And uh, along with us, we're, um, we're both part of a California policy group called the California Food and Farming Network. And the great thing, about, there's about 40 or 50 organizations who are part of that, and it includes California Food Policy Advocates, which, which is, is a leading organization around CalFresh and food stamps and kind of food access issues. And then it includes kind of everybody in that, in that bucket from, from sustainable ag to that wing, and you know, I was talking to, I have a friend who is a um, professor of public health and started the, um, the Alliance for Nurses, which trains nurses around environmental health issues. 
and she's doing a lot of work in California and pretty well connected. And one of the things that she said is she feels like we need to get we need to get all of the players who are in the tent together, and we need to figure out what our collective ask is. Because there's like even even I just reviewed CCOF's policy platform, and you know, there's like six different areas, and each one has four policy recommendations. We're not going to be able to do all that at once, right? So how do we how do we how do we think more collectively and say, okay, if we want to move all of this work together, what's the number one ask around the Healthy Soils Program? What's the number one ask for organic farm transition? What's the number one ask, ask for food access? Like, and then, and this is under the climate tent, just to say, and, um, and then go to our state, which has a very innovative democratic governor, democratic controlled, and really sees themselves as a leader in the country. And how, but how do we create the collective ask so that legislators aren't going, is it this? Or, you know, there's so much in front of them right now. And so I think that's really helpful to think about. And for all of our work, like how do we, how do we think about the most leveraged things that are going to move the whole piece forward and not be doing the trench fighting for like our little piece of the, of the puzzle, but really come together um, as, a, as a collective group. So, yeah. Yeah, look at CCOF's benefits report. It's very, very, it'll be a very helpful document. I cite it all the time, like the farm worker study. So anything else? Yeah. So um, there's a UCSF. Yep. There's a pediatric endocrinologist there mm -hmm. who's one of my personal heroes in the world. Um, his name's Robert Lustig. Yeah, I know, I know, Rob. Okay. Yeah. And so he actually did a thing years ago about Yep. One of my big bugaboos is the fact that juice is considered in the school lunch program yep. as fruit. And he's done incredible, like he was ahead of his time demonstrating that fructose is booze without the buzz. Yep. The cause of yep. non-alcoholic fatty liver, which we're seeing in epidemic proportions right. with kids. So, you know, how do we, you know, how do you guys work with him? Because you're light years ahead of us out here to change these standards. So this is this is the policy piece, right? I mean, I think um, in CCF's policy platform, there's a big focus on school lunch, um, and again, that idea of going upstream. And if we can, if you know, if, if we if we used our schools as we could, the way that we that is possible, but we're not doing, we could change chronic disease in a generation. You know, yep, exactly, exactly. So this is all that like. The standard, um, you know, dietitian kind of experience is so far behind where the research is, and and just to say, at a federal level, um, industry is a huge um, prohibitor of of making these changes, and and again, we have to we have to start talking honestly about that. I mean, we there were there were a lot of things that didn't get into the last farm bill, that didn't get into the last review of the dietary guidelines because industry has that influence that they have and that we have to realize that. That's why I think working at the state level um, around, you know, how do you think about, like we've, we've been working on getting some extra money into the state budget so that, um, that we can improve both local food and organic food in school lunch. So 25 cents a meal to be able to buy organic food, 15 cents a meal to be able to buy local food, um, there's some, uh, there have been some talk about more plant forward meals and plant forward choices within school lunch. And if you can pull the research together and again, and get a coalition, you can work on state lunch at a state level, at school lunch at a state level. And because um, the states can put extra money in, you know, that's, that's their right. I mean, the federal government has what the federal government has, but, but working at a state level, especially if you're in a small state and you have a good coalition um, to look at driving some of that change, yeah. The other study that, we, that we're working on doing for the state is um, we're putting together research with UCSF around um, at-risk pregnant moms in the Medicaid program. And the whole thing with, with um, food as medicine right now is health insurers want to see a pretty fast return on investment. So you've got to be able to show some cost savings pretty quickly. So if we could show reduced a low birth weight or and reduced neonatal intensive care costs, then you're getting that quick return. But now you're talking about going really upstream because um, uh, mom's nutrition 
it impacts you know, diabetes and you know, all kinds of things through the lifespan. And so we're really, we've gotten some good initial results from or indications from legislators that they would be interested and we're planning a year from now to be able to have the lit review and, and a, 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 um, like a design inter an intervention that we want to propose and then we want to go to the state and do what we just did which is get a round of like three years of funding to be able to do a statewide study. Um, and, and again, going congestive heart failure is incurable and those patients are really at the end of their life I and mean, you can maintain quality of life and all that. But being able to go really upstream would open the conversation around where, where food as medicine and medically tailored meals could be used. And that feels like a valuable thing to do. So. One more, yeah. Awesome. Like, is that not awesome? That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. So, yep. Great. There's a policy win. Exactly. I mean, this is a that's great. And, and as soon as you get a win, then you've laid the foundation for the next one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time <laughs> and the, the collective work that we're all doing. My contact info is up there and happy to talk with anyone. And um, if you want to know more about any of the stuff we talked about, just please reach out. Thank you so much.